change in the fundraising sector has never been greater. But innovations in technology are evolving faster than our ability to understand them. Are these advances good or bad? Do they have unintended consequences? And what is the application to the global fundraising sector? That's what we're here to find out. Welcome to the Fundraising AI Podcast, your up-to-date resource for responsible AI for the global fundraising community, hosted by Nathan Chappelle and Scott Rosencrantz. Hey, welcome everyone for episode 24 of the Fundraising AI Podcast. I'm Nathan Chappelle. I'm here with Scott Rosencrantz. Both of us are on the East Coast, but we're not together today. So I know. Yeah, you're four hours right. away. Yeah, I don't know. Roughly. I have no idea how far away I am from you. We'll say four hours away. Nobody can call us out on it. By walking or uh, train or airplane? Car. Car. Okay. Car. We probably are. Electric I'm in Maryland. I'm in Maryland. You're in mid-state New York, which I don't even know if it's a thing, but it, I call it mid-state New York. It's where the grass is green and the, the cows roam free. It's so great to be here. We've been looking forward to this episode for a while. We've actually been talking about this episode probably longer than the others, probably three months or something. And it really came out of response from a lot of feedback from people that were listening to our podcast that would ping us and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have a friend, Angel, who is just an awesome person, probably the most generous person I know, who has listened to every episode of our podcast. He's not in the nonprofit sector. And he's like, I'm learning a lot. I'm listening to it while I drive, but I still don't know a lot of the things that you're talking about. And that's been compounded by a bunch of other comments that we've gotten from other people who are like, I'm following it. I love it. I'm learning things, but I still don't quite understand the basics. So maybe can you, you know, bring it down for me. So we decided to do an episode called Angel's Episode. So shout out to our good friend Angel, which I'm sure will totally embarrass him, but it's called Angel's Episode <laughs> and we're going to break it down. So Scott, you and I do a lot of webinars, presentations on AI. And often, uh -huh. you know, when we're sitting there in an audience, it's like this wide mix of people who are like, when we pull them, it's like, I'm deathly afraid of using AI to I've used it, you know, 12 times before I had breakfast. So we're kind of used to having to kind of cater to a broad group, but today's episode, we're going to just like really shrink it down, cover some of those basics in less than 30 minutes, and hopefully, I guess, give a starting point, a framework of understanding for people that, you know, will better be able to apply AI in their lives, evaluate whether it's, you know, good or bad for certain topics or, or projects, go from there. So I don't know. What do you think, Scott? We just jump in? I'm ready. Do it. All right. Well... I think it's best to start with this idea, a little bit of the transformative shift. So we don't have to go to, we won't go esoteric because this is about 101 and you and I are going to hold each other accountable. But the reality is that AI is a transformational, but also exponential technology. And I'll explain those being. The transformational part is that this is so big and so formative that it will change every aspect of our lives that we truly believe that if if you are connected to the internet and you are fortunate to live in a part of the world that has electricity and you have access to, to the internet, this will be the equivalent of you essentially using the internet, that it will change almost every aspect of how you think of doing things, where in the old internet days, you'd have to go and look for that yellow pages and you know look up a phone number for a plumber and you had no idea if it was good or bad or call a phone number to get what time the movie was playing at and you miss the recording so you had to listen to the whole uh -huh. thing over again we all remember those days and we it's it's almost unfathomable and impossible for us to imagine going back to a world where that that we didn't have the internet ai is very very much the same way it'll be almost impossible to distinguish what we're using and not using in the future because we'll be so used to the value that it provides to us in our day-to-day -day life through maps, games, watching TV recommendations, credit decisions that happen immediately, whatever it might be, that's intertwined with everything we do. So one is transformative. The second word I use is exponential. So like the internet that was basically built and created to send and receive data, it, it the protocols that it used to send and receive data operate the same way today that they did when the internet was created. If not changed at all, it, it basically is a validation of packets of data are sent and then they're received and then they return information and back and forth, back and forth. The internet operates today exactly the same way functionally that it did whenever it was really released. I mean, I started using the internet in 1996, I think, 
and it was very slow and we had to listen to dial up and all that, but it sent and received data. It's got a lot more colors now. It's a lot, of an, a lot more animation. It's obviously a lot, lot faster and a lot bigger than it was then. But the difference being is that AI is not a static technology. A static technology is a technology that operates the same way every time. And if it doesn't, your, your page doesn't reload on the internet, it's a bug. There's some error somewhere, or your internet went down, or something happened. A you know, website is not configured correctly. AI, on the other hand, is considered an exponential technology. The exponential technology means, and what Scott and I say this a lot, is that the worst that, uh, AI that it ever uses today, and tomorrow will be the worst AI you use, and the next day will be the worst. AI is exponential because AI now can train AI. And we'll talk about the modes of AI in a little in a little bit and the different areas that it's doing this. But one very clear example is that if I back in the day in 1997, we built a website to hire a person that coded HTML. HTML is a language that websites are built in. And we had to find a person that literally could like dream and it was like a second language. They could like could speak in HTML to code a website to be the right colors and have the right functionality. The difference being is that this exponential part is that now I don't even have to program an HTML. I can I can say, build me a website, write me a code to build a website, and, and AI will do that for you. Generative AI will do that for you. The exponential part kicks in when AI is training new AI. So that example about building websites is, is very, frankly, a very easy task for AI to understand. But what if you had AI build another AI? And then that AI builds another AI, and that AI builds another AI. So the exponential nature of AI is that it's improving itself, which means it's not static, and that it's getting better and better and better, faster than any other technology that's ever been created because of that, that mode. Next year, not to go crazy on terms, and then we'll sh shift this back to you, is that we'll move into an area called agentive AI. And we have a glossary of terms on the fundraising AI website. You can go through them and, and you know get deeper into these things. But agentive AI is essentially where AI is essentially allowed to create new AI and manage that AI. So say a supervisor AI will create workers and that supervisor AI will manage the workers to complete tasks. So they are not sequential, like task one, task two, task three, task four, task five that say those agents can all create tasks at the same time so the worker achieves its work faster. So exponential technology is growing very dramatically, dynamically and dramatically, and you know for sure the worst AI you'll ever use is today. So hopefully that covers a little bit of the why and the what for now, and then we're gonna drill down into kind of where people are at and kind of thinking about, is this you know scary, is it not? So Scott, why don't you just kind of level set us a little bit here and then we'll just continue to peel back the onion. Yeah, well, I think another thing to add to that is why is why am I bombarded with AI now all of a sudden? Like, is it new? Did it just come out? And it's not that it's new, right? But to Nathan's point, it's exponential. And so we it was November of 2022 that ChatGPT came out. And that was a new form of AI in terms of, generative, right, which we'll talk about, but it was also accessible. Whereas all other, most other forms of AI were running behind the scenes. You didn't really directly interact with it. You couldn't direct and control the output at, like you can with generative AI. So yeah. Amazon, Netflix, Google, those are all classic examples of AI running behind the scenes, allowing you to leverage it and be more efficient and decide what show you want to watch out of a catalog of you know, 500,000 shows quicker or what product you want to buy off of Amazon yeah. significantly quicker without having to sift through so much stuff, right? So the predictive has always been there and the largest companies that are the largest companies in the world are as large as they are because they've been relying on AI of all forms for a yeah. very long time now. So why, right? don't, why don't you do this? You're really good at this and that's why I always task you with this is why don't you at level set because there's lots of AI tools in the toolbox. Why don't you describe the basis of the two main tools that people, you know, I mean, there's a lot that maybe they, they, they want to know later, but like for the average person that's going to a dinner party, like give them something that they can impress their friends with, you know, in the differences between predictive AI and generative AI. Yeah. So predictive is taking data to predict something that is going to happen in the future based on a data set that looks at historical information, right? So historically, 
people who look like me demographically and purchase similar things on Amazon are likely to purchase these other things on Amazon, right? Amazon is using that as a predictive model. Whereas generative is creating new content, generating new information, new content, new creative aspects. So the, the, a key difference is predictive models are trained to make a decision between A and B. Is this example with all this data I have going to do A or B? Are they going to do this or are they not going to do this? And then what's the confidence that I feel that they are going to do A or B, right? Whereas generative is more open-ended. There's no definitive answer. You could ask the same exact question, the same exact way to the same AI model, and it will give a different answer because it's coming up with something new every single time. So it's it's more on the creative side, on the uh, subjective side, the qualitative side, whereas predictive is more on the quantitative side, the logical, the objective, right? And so those are those are two distinct things. And we often talk about both are valuable in their own right, but it's really when you combine the two that you see significant impact. Yeah, absolutely. So when we're approaching AI, I think it's interesting, you know, Scott, when we we talk with people and we're like, well, what's your orientation around AI? We get a lot of different answers, right? They range from, in fact, we did this recently at a conference and we're like, this whole group of people are like, what are you hearing from your friends, from your clients, from your colleagues, from you yourself? And, and it literally ranged from actually quite a bit of fear. Is it going to change my job? Is it going to replace my job? What areas are most vulnerable? Is it going to destroy the movie business that can destroy music or art, or is it going to change it? Then it moves from like curiosity to like, well, you know, I want to know more about it because I've heard other people that are, are using it to, you know, plan vacations and do scavenger hunts with their kids and stuff like that. So there's a lot of that curiosity. There's also a lot of skepticism about like the buzz and the hype of like, well, it's all hype. You know, it's like crypto. Everybody was all about crypto and crypt crypto like blew up, but crypto's kind of back again. How much is how much of this is hype and when should I pay attention to kind of the idea that it's just like magic box and I shouldn't trust it. Like it's just like is this magic box and everything I put into it is going to be used to come, you know, back at me in the future and the robot overlords are going to come and you better be nice to it. And I, I think most of it was like this, like cautious optimism of like, okay, I'm being cautious. I'm like trying little things here. But I think what we find is also a lot of people just don't know where to start. Like yeah. they're just like, I've heard this stuff. And every time I hear about it, I'm feeling a little bit worse because I don't know where to start. You know, throwback to Angel, you know, it's like a person who I, I think we were at a dinner party one night and we we're like talking about it and he like downloads you know chat gpt on their phone and on his phone and it's just like you know trying stuff and now text me all the time it's like i did this thing or whatever and it's like whether it's create an image or or you know investigate something new i think starting is probably one of the biggest limitations for a lot of people a lot of people we've heard this a lot that there's like this 10 hour magic rule right i don't know for you if you experience that as well like i know you're an early adopter and you or just like you're like all in and you know you're gonna you're gonna believe technology until it betrays you or, or proves you wrong like what do you think the path is for people that you know are afraid to start like what do you recommend and then what steps either do you take to like to stay with it if you will yeah so they and i i was at a conference where i was talking to a, a number of people about this as well so it, it's very top of mind if you don't know where to start it comes down to one of two things either you don't know where the tools are, or you don't know what to do with the tools, right? right? So have you ever logged into chat or gone to chat.openai.com before? If you haven't, that's a good place to start, right? Probably the best place to start. If you have gone there, what do you do with it? That's where it gets harder because it's a different use case for every single person, right? So the example that I love is going to ChatGPT or Perplexity or any of those and saying, hey, I am a so-and-so. So for me, it would be, I work at donor search. I oversee data science models and build custom models for nonprofits. I have a two-year-old. I'm a vegetarian. I live in world of New York. What are ways that I can use generative AI in my data? Right? right. You don't need to have the answers. You just need to have a starting point. And it might not give you perfect responses, but you could ask it to say, list out 80 examples of how I could do it. There might be some in there that are good. There might be some that are horrible, but at least something to move yeah. you down that path a little bit further. 
I, I always find that so interesting. It's an epiphany when we share that often because we do, do that at conferences a lot. It's like if you don't know how, you know, open or uh, generative AI can help you with your job, just ask it. And it's like, hey, you know, this is my job to your point. It's like, what are the, what are some areas that you can help me do my job more efficiently? These are the things I like to do. These things I don't like to do. And, you know, treat it as if it's a conversation. So I think that's really smart. I think it's a great, great yeah. starting point. And if you're uncomfortable doing it with your job, do it in your family life. You, you were a really early adopter and be like, I want to go on vacation. I have this kind of budget. These are the, this is the scenery that we really enjoy. I've got a two-year-old and whatever. And I think you've been pretty impressed and you kind of like you, yeah, I mean, it's actually per saved you a lot of time from doing like a thousand Google searches and looking on, you know, Expedia and all those things. Right. My, my, we had a vacation coming up, you know, this was probably a year ago. My wife had spent hours researching, trying to find a place and wherever we were going, we we're getting booked or it was just too expensive or anything. And I had spent 15 minutes on Bing and it gave me 13 hotels that she hadn't come across and. We ended up staying in two different ones, and it was wonderful. It was incredibly yeah. easy. Yeah, and I think jumping back to your your exponential. Whenever I think about that, I think about. Do you remember what v AI generated videos looked like a year ago? Yeah. For anyone that doesn't, like Google Will Smith eating spaghetti, and it's terrifying. Right. Yeah. Right? And now AI generated videos are Hollywood quality. Like it's yeah, you, it's incredibly challenging to differentiate between AI and real. And yeah. we're still just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit about modalities. And that's a word that gets a lot of people caught up. You know, when you say, you know, this, this AI, this generative AI is multimodal. A lot of people hear that term multimodal or modalities, you know, it's, it's a confusing term. Do you want to describe it? And then let's kind of go through the different modalities. I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we know five that we use pretty regularly. I think that's going to be really helpful because I think, again, it's like our equation is like I'm in front of this, you know, computer screen and it's, you know, one dimensional and it doesn't, you know, I only think in one dimension, but generative AI is, is, is multiple dimensions, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to take it or do you want to take it? I'll take it. And then you fill in any gaps that I might've missed, but uh, so multimodal, there's also input and output, right? Multimodal is information and sources that you're giving an AI model to do something with. So you can use speech, you can speak to it, you can write text, you can give it a command that you're just typing in, you can give it a file, you can give it an image, you can open up your camera and have it at like live look at something. And then in the output side, you can also get all those things back, you can get a file back, you can get code back, you can get voice back, you can get an image generated for you or a video generated for you. So it's, it's not I only type this and I only get written text back and that's it. That's only yeah. it. it's multimodal that one model or it's relying on a number of models behind the scenes, but you can interact with it in multiple ways and get multiple outputs coming to you yeah. as well. Yeah. And I hate using output, the word outputs or inputs on a, on angels episode. So it means data that you put in data that you get out. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I mean, that's exactly it. I think it's just so different than other types of technology. It's like, no matter what I try to do on the internet, it kind of gives me, you know, kind of the same thing. I get a lot of answers. I got to distill those answers. So with the five kind of main areas, just want to make sure we're double clicking and you covered these, but you can use one of the modes. It's just like to, to distill information. So at this point, if I get a, if I get a report and to be honest, if anyone sends me a report, that's more than half a page, I'm putting it into perplexity or Claude or chat GPT. Like I have not read a report for a while already. <laughs> I think two months ago, your limit was like 10 pages. So yeah. it just oh, decreased like half to half a page. page. Yeah. Months. That's yeah. I mean, it's an amazing, uh, tool to distill and condense a lot. So like I got a 27 yeah. page report the other day, I'm like, what is, what is this report about? Like, you know, what's in it, what's missing that kind of thing. It also can do that with web, with web. So like, if there's just a long website, you're like, what does this company do? Or what does that, you know, that vacation place have? So information distillation. So like, just use it for like text and putting stuff in to distill it down. Number two, you already mentioned it, image creation or image generation. So write a prompt and be like, give me an image of my dog having a picnic on the moon and it will it will do that or, you know, a Frenchie driving a Coca-Cola truck or whatever it might be. And there, you know, you're going to get these like images that aren't a copy of another image. I think that's what people are blown away of. 
image never ever existed in the in the history of humanity. It's not somewhere in some obscure library. It's going to create a new image based on what you tell it. And then, by the way, if you don't like it, you're like, give it another you know, sentence. And it's like, oh no, I want it to be more like this, and have this iterative conversation. The third is around voice generation and translation. This is like mind blowing, actually. Where you know, if those that use you know, ChatGPT, where you're like, hey, you know, like you know, can you give me places that I should go on vacation? And it's like, oh, okay, let's talk about that and have a conversation back and forth, um, but also translation. So GPT, uh, OpenAI, GPT 4.0 serves as this like on uh, real-time translator. So I could say, here's my phone and I'm going to put it in front of me. Everything that I speak will be in English and everything that someone else will speak and it will be in say Spanish and translate that back and forth in real time. Like this is stuff like sci-fi movies are made of, but it's yeah. like, it's today, right? Real life translator. So that mode of being able to use voice and receive voice back and forth, um, vision recognition. There's some amazing, amazing things where, uh, chat open AI did this little thing where you had a, uh, using video on your phone to show a math problem and someone like writing the math problem out. And it's like, oh, I see what you're doing. Like what would happen if you carry the one or for people that are sight impaired to be able to hold your phone out and say, there's, you know, this beautiful lake in front of you where, you know, there's people, whatever, and to try to really describe in the essence of an image around you, helping people with certain disabilities that will allow them to really kind of immerse into a situation. And then the fourth, yeah, I guess that's, or fifth is around data analysis. And this is also a new advent because I think you and I being more in the predictive AI world would have never said, well, you know, generative is going to be able to provide you a chart of the data, you know, but, you know, of course, now you can say, well, here's a lot of data. And can you tell me what's important in this data in a bar graph? And it will do that for you. And so the different modes are not something to be afraid of. It really is. I, I say this a lot to people that the limits of how you use generative AI are honestly the limits of your creativity that I would almost say, Think about using generative AI for everything that you don't like to do. So don't use it for things you like to do because those right. are inherently human and don't right. take away right. the things that bring you joy. But yeah. if the 90% of things that annoy you or you know, that you don't like to do, have it prove you wrong. Like, like go to it first, create your orientation of like this gen AI first approach to things I don't like to do and have it prove you wrong. And most likely if it can't do it today, it will be able to do it in three months or two months or two days. So mm -hmm. that's just essentially part of that exponential aspect of it. I do think it would be good to talk about tips, right? And yeah. I think that's a great tip that comes up often. Don't evaluate it on things that you like to do, right? Right? Because you're going to be biased and you're going to see the nuances of, oh, I could have done this better. And a lot of times that comes up as writing, right? So I don't like writing, but for people who are writers, it's recommended to not have generative AI create the first draft, but rather you create the first draft and have generative AI revise it or review it, right? Yeah. At the very least, it can find typos, grammatical errors. But if you ask it to kind of come at it from a different perspective, right? Or take like a debater's viewpoint on it. How would someone who is trying to, you know, kind of negate what I'm saying here, how would they come across at it? And what should I do to beef up my argument? So Go with your strengths, start with your strengths, yeah. but start ChatGPT or generative AI with things that you want to offload that take up your time you don't want to do anymore. Yeah, so that's that's a great tip. Another tip is don't ever just copy and paste. Like verify, yeah. like we, especially Scott and I, and you know, really with our focus on the nonprofit sector is not take a trust and verify approach, but a verify then trust. And even to your point, like I make it a habit that when I, if I ask, GPT to create something and I iterate it and go back and forth that when I'm done with my human input on that, I push it. I use the word input. I'm sorry. When I push it back in, I load it back in to, to say whatever tool, cause that we use all of them as, is that this is my final. I want you to know that this is my final so that it can add to its memory of like what I did to it. And then next time it will take me instead of three iterations. It might make, it might take me two. It might take me three, but I'm, I'm adding to that. So I think that the verify then trust um, aspect of like, don't just take anything, copy and paste it. Make sure that, you know, you're asking for in a really easy way. If you're asking a, a tool, a generative AI tool to give you data and the accuracy of that data is important, 
ask it to tell you how it came to that conclusion, whether it's links that it found or whether it's like, this is the data that I found in the table and, and it, it had this variance. So this is why I, I, this is why I surfaced it. So ask it to validate its findings back to you. And that's a really, really good way to do it. So it's not causing you more work. I love that tip of giving it back your revisions, right? So that way, like, if you want this to learn you better and learn what you want better, the only way to do it is to say, this is what I want. This is the final form. And that brings up another point, not so much a tip, but memory. These models are learning from you and your preferences and your likes and dislikes. And the more you feed it, you could be explicit in saying, hey, whenever I ask you for a list, make sure you put it in five bullet points of no more than 10 words. Or it'll learn every time you make revision. So it, especially yeah. ChatGPT, the, the new versions are tracking all that information for you specifically to give you better results. Yeah. I think that brings up uh, the next tip I wanted to highlight, which is know your privacy settings. I, it goes back to the thing that Scott and I have talked about probably on at least half of our episodes is that responsible AI is everyone's responsibility. Just because I have a safe car doesn't mean I can drive it irresponsibly and be safe, right? So don't defer to OpenAI or Microsoft or Google or Amazon or anyone else to say, well, they said they're safe. I saw it on their website. They use the word responsible. Therefore, everything I do. It is your responsibility to understand your privacy settings. In every tool, you can click on settings. You can understand privacy. And in most tools, GP, I know ChatGPT, or ChatGPT, OpenAI, Claude, Perplexity, allow you to change your privacy settings that, that basically says that you can use my data to train other models or not. If you're using a free tool, what is your the famous line, Scott, if you're using something free? Uh, yeah, if you're not paying for it, you are the you are the product. If you're, yeah. if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Yeah. If you're not paying for the product, you are the yeah. product. It makes sense. I mean, if you live in a capitalistic you know society, you know if you're a socialist society, then maybe not. That, but in our society, if you aren't paying for the product, you are the product. So understand your privacy settings. The third, and this comes from Ethan Mollick, I think from his book, is I don't even say the third. We're on like tip number five. Speak to AI like a human, but tell it what kind of human you want it to be. And this is probably the biggest of the of the the people that get benefit from generative AI is because they stop treating it like it's a Google search. What time is the movie? What time does Best Buy close? Like whatever it might be. And treat it like a human, but tell it the kind of human you want it to be. It's like you use this example just in one of your other examples. It's like, hey, take the persona of a, a travel agent and you know evaluate these things for me. Take the persona of a, a cantankerous donor or take the persona of an advisor to, you know, or an analyst, you will get better results if you do that. And so, but by speaking to like a human, and I'm probably the worst offender of this, like an anthropomorphizing the, like the idea of like treating it like a human. Cause like, I actually have a name for my AI and I'm like, <laughs> Hey, and in my settings, it says to address me by my first name, which helps unlock for my brain. It's like, hi, Nathan, like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, oh, this is the, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, this new webinar, like, what do you think? And then I have a conversation with it. I can tell you that's the single most formative thing that has changed it for me is to get the most out of generative AI is for me to not treat it like a computer program or something in the cloud. But honestly, like sounds horrible, but like as a, a human intelligence in a way that it can respond to my inquiry and then I have something to respond to. I'm not saying it's human. I'm not saying we've a treat, uh, augmented general intelligence, which we have not. It's going to be maybe several years, maybe two days, but no, I mean, but I know the difference, but it helps me treat it and actually extract more information from it better than if I had just treat it with a flat statement that just didn't have any contextual basis to it. Yeah. And I think another thing along those lines is when you're working with it, have it help you, yeah. right? I, I learned this from Gail Roberts, shout out to Gail Roberts, but every, you, she put in her settings and I copied this from her, review your result and make recommendations on how the result could be better, right? Yeah. But you can also say, every time I ask you to do something or give you a command or whatever it is, follow up with any necessary questions to make sure you have all the information to be able to execute properly. Yeah. So allow it to work with you. And that way you can learn the types of things that it's looking for to be able to provide a better output. Absolutely. And then another thing you mentioned was Ethan Mollick. I think another yeah. good tip is find people 
that are in this space, that are providing information that you can learn from. You and I both learn a lot from Ethan Malik, Ali K. Miller, Connor Grennan, and then you get in those circles of following them on LinkedIn. You see what other people they reference and just build yep. that resource and that database essentially on, on social media of who's sharing this information, who's sharing updates, tips, tricks of themselves. Learn, their own. learn something new every day. Take baby steps. Listen, yeah. learn something new every day. And every day there's going to be something new and different and better. The last two, I just want to highlight what we already talked about, but just so people are clear that they're tips, always invite AI to the table. And that means that it needs to become your first orientation of like, it's that old habit of like in driving all the way across town to Target to realize that the thing that you, you know, wanted to, we went there for is out of stock and you could have bought it on Amazon and it would have been there by three o'clock. Like we, we learned quickly because driving across town was painful and walking across the parking lot and dealing with all that. And so we learned quickly of like, well, I'm going to see if I don't need it this moment, I'm going to see if it's available and we can deliver it to my door. So always invite the AI to the table means that you just, it becomes your natural first instinct is to be like, I'm going to see what AI has, you know, to say about this thing. And that will help a lot. And the last one is we, again, we started with this, we're going to end with it. Assume that AI, the worst AI you'll ever use is today. And that will help also unlock this thing of like, it's broken. It doesn't work because right. it, the AI tomorrow will not be the same as AI today. And so you have to stop, people have to stop thinking about AI in this binary thing of like, it works or it doesn't work or it's good or it's bad. It's here, it's here to stay. It will continue to evolve. It will continue to get better. When ChatGPT came out, all people could talk about is hallucinations. Hallucination was this word that people use while well, it would just make up stuff and it would make it up very confidently just make up facts very confidently. Hallucinations now are less than 5% of responses in a generative AI model and the best models. And they're basically getting down to zero. And so, you know, the more data that they have, the better that they get every day as they evolve, they're growing and getting better exponentially. And so that was the last of my tips. I don't know. I hope, first of all, this is like helpful. We went through a lot of information, yeah. 32 minutes. Did we miss any really big, obvious ones? I don't, I mean, not that I know of, I'm going to say no, but I just want to jump back to the second to last one. Like for me personally, it's still a challenge to bring AI to the table. And I work in this space. I'm in this day after day, but like it's muscle memory, right? I'm better at going to arc or perplexity than I am going to Google. So I'm there. But when I'm working on a new task that I haven't built that muscle memory for yet to go to ChatGPT, I still find my way going through the old, old methods. And then like an hour later, like, Oh crap, I could have done this in 15 seconds. All right. So it's, it's yeah. not, it doesn't come naturally and it's something just to continually work out, but all these things are, it's all iterative. I mean, it so comes just, naturally for me because I'm lazy. I think, I think that's the difference. You're a harder worker, more diligent than I am. I'm like, is there a faster, cheaper, better path that do this thing? <laughs> it's become for me now, it's like almost honestly painful for me to do other type of work because it's like, I can just level up so much. It's like it. It's like Red Bull, it gives you wings. So pro tip, and we'll end on this because we're already over time. Pro tip, what if you had to pick, oh, this is hard. I actually almost don't want to put oh. the year into the spot. Okay, if you had to pick three AI tools that you can't live without, what would they be? Perplexity, uh, absolutely. And we're, talk we're talking generative AI. I don't know. Right? I just left that pretty broad. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll say generative. I'm, I'm limiting it to generative. Okay. Uh, perplexity for sure, even though they're coming under fire, that'll probably be in our next episode. Search, I still have a lot of hope for that one. Never used I'm it, so yeah, using it on a daily basis. It's not perfect, but it gets me there. And then, I mean, I just can't wait till Apple Intelligence, Apple Intelligence, and Multion, the agentive kind of web. That's color. another episode too. Okay, all right, you took a what about you? to a shortcut. My go-to every day is is ChatGPT. I mean, it's just like it's kind of like diet coke for me you know so i just like you know it's just my first instinct but i use perplexity a lot number two and i use claude you know so i think i use ChatGPT as a workhorse i use perplexity when i want more accuracy and i want like just references and and when i'm doing things that are that like if i'm analyzing a report i almost always will use perplexity and if i'm just writing something that i would want it to be like more my voice than than claude which is also coming under fire so that will be another in our next episode so yeah all those things i think are good pro tips but you know hard to go wrong you know copilot's becoming immersed into everything microsoft right now and that will be right. that will be like apple intelligence so it will just be like ai at scale because i i am lazy 
And so whatever AI tool is embedded in the work that I'm already doing is the tool that I'll probably use. <laughs> so let's be real. Right. Two, two shout outs are Zapier. Zapier just makes it much easier to connect things so you can leverage AI kind of passively. And then Logi Options, use that too. So you can just right click your mouse and it'll come up with five prompt. It's a beautiful yeah. tool. Yeah, right. it's pretty cool. Yeah. So again, well, we hope Angel's episode was helpful for you. I think this will live at least Angel. Forever. Yeah, at least for one person, it will be helpful. Hopefully it was helpful Maybe. For I don't know. I'll hear about it. <laughs> it's not for sure. Be like, what the heck? No, I hope this was helpful. I, I, you know, sometimes we just forget that, you know, we're so immersed yeah. in this and we're so interested in following trends of what's next that, you know, we kind of forget that, you know, we like, we look behind and no one's there. So we hope that you're still behind. We hope that you're, you know, following us and you're finding value in this. If there are other areas that you want us to dive into in AI, you know, predictive, generative, or anything else, let us know. Uh, if you like this, please share this if, and uh, like, and subscribe, because that's how, you know, Scott and I sleep better at night, knowing that, you know, people are listening and we're not alone in the universe. But we're so encouraged by people that have have tuned in and share with us that, you know, they've listened and that they're finding some value. So thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for all the good work that you do. Use AI for good, not evil, and stay in touch. Yeah. Thanks all. Well.